Hi, everybody. I know every, uh, people are still logging on. Uh, we're a couple minutes late, so we apologize. I'm, I'm Dr. Roney, if you've never been on before, and this is Dr. Brittany Petak. Mm -hmm. Hi, she's, everyone. She's joining me tonight as my co-host. Maybe she can host and I'll just <laughs> sit back and relax, right? No, I'm just kidding. So, um, but yeah, as, as people join, uh, I want to make sure that uh, I welcome everybody. The ones that uh, are on weekly, we hear it or bi-weekly, we hear it consistently that they appreciate the information or you appreciate the information, you learn a lot. And that um, that's the objective. It's really just to constantly give you information uh, that could help yourself. And uh, sometimes, you know, being your own best advocate is the key. And that's what education and information does. So uh, we love doing it. I think it, I do think it helps a lot. Uh, peace of mind is one of the biggest things that I think it helps with. When you have a good plan, and I know you, those of you that have been on here a lot hear me say this all the time, but I'm a big plan person. I like a plan. I like when it's well researched. I like when it's um, well articulated to me personally. And then um, I feel good about it. And then working it typically mitigates the downside. And that's all we're trying to do here. We're trying to mitigate the downside consistently and maximize your upside when it comes to uh, dealing with a chronic disease. Uh, so welcome. If you haven't been on before, again, Dr. Roney, this is Dr. Petak. Um, I'm here every other week. And then we have different guests on uh, and this week. Obviously, it's going to be Dr. Petak. And our topic this week is going to be on radiation. Mm -hmm. And the, the real, the, the uh, headline is, is healing from radiation, correct? And one of the, the side goals with that is kind of demystifying it. What is radiation? How does it work? How does it kill cancer cells? When is it important to consider in your care plan? And then if we need to use it, how do we heal from it? Like you said. Yeah. And, and uh, we, you know, I, I, Dr. Petak as well, but I work with a lot of the new patients consistently uh, in the clinic. And the one thing that I always tell them, we're very integrative, right? Meaning we're, we, we are conservative in our approach uh, on the natural side. Mm -hmm. However, we're not naive, right? And, and what I mean by that is there are times when a case is presented to us that we might need to agree with the conventional doctors as far as, or the oncologists as far as chemo, surgery, radiation, whatever that might be, simply because what's presented. And so what we try to do is we try to look at the risk versus benefit or benefit versus risk of that proposition. Mm -hmm. Is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. So each case is individually, um, I guess, looked at to determine, hey, is this a good idea or not? And I'll, I'll give a personal, um, something happened personally with a family member. So this family member, and you, you may have heard me tell this story before, had uh, a lump in the breast, turned out to be cancerous. They did the biopsy uh, and then they recommended standard protocol, the lumpectomy. And then they recommended three weeks of targeted radiation. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, they, they'll recommend uh, some other things with that as well, hormone blockers, et cetera. So the question that I asked that I thought was really relevant, well, what is the, if we just did lumpectomy, what, it, what is the percentage of, and they give you the five-year survival rate. It's just the way they, mm -hmm. that's their parameters, right? So they, they said that's in the mid to 80%. Percent, so like eighty, say eighty five percent, and I said, okay, well, if they if she did the targeted radiation, the three weeks of targeted radiation, what does that look like in addition to the lumpectomy? And they said that's probably ninety five plus percent, you know, and so that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. So with that, we or or this person decided to do the targeted radiation after the lumpectomy, but. We also did some of the strategies that Dr. Petak will talk about tonight to offset the downside. So there's one thing, because I'm sure you hear it a lot, patients come to the clinic and they're very afraid of radiation and they're very afraid of chemotherapy um, and some of these other more conventional techniques. However, I, well, let me back up. I understand that if it's in the bubble of just doing the conventional model, right? However, because of what they may have seen, they have family members that went through this or went through that, and they felt like they didn't do well, and they, they were maybe harmed more than helped type of thing. But if you have an additional plan, you always hear me say there's one chapter 
of the 20 chapter book, which is the chemo, surgery, and radiation. But there's 19 other chapters that we can include in that to mitigate the downside. So you get a win-win. You get the best of, say, chemo or radiation without the major downside if all these other uh, modalities and procedures, therapies are, are done simultaneously through that process. Is that fair? Yeah. And I that's agree. that, would you say that's the topic tonight? That's the topic. Yeah, that's yes. the topic. I nailed it. Yay. We'll start a little more technical than that. Yes. And then yes. we'll zoom out. <laughs> yes, uh, absolutely. So we'll get into the Dr. Petak will anyway, and I'll, and I'll help, but uh, she really has done the research on this. So I'm going to defer a lot to her with this one, but uh, yeah, we'll, we will get into the nitty gritty about what is radiation. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the, what are the negatives? What are the positives, pros, cons, things like that, and kind of get into the, the more of the details. So at the end of the day, information is power. And so if you were faced with this, this decision, you are a family member or, wh or whomever, you have this information that where whatever you decide, you feel good about the decision because you were informed. And I think that's uh, what this is all about, especially tonight. And every week we do that. But tonight, uh, I think it's, it's really relevant. So again, for a family member of mine, we made that decision because the risk was way lower than, or the benefit outweighed the risk. Plus we did all these therapies to help mitigate the downside. And for us, that was the right decision. So it could be different for you for many different reasons, many different variables. But like I said, at least we have, you have the information. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen. We'll get through, if you've been on with me before, you know I like to do a quick intro. So if you're new to the uh, cancer conversation, I do that for you all as well. I mean, it can't hurt to hear it over and over again, that's for sure. But if you're new to the, to the cancer conversation, I just wanna give you an idea of the philosophy of, of what we do and how we treat. And it's a plan, but I'll go through briefly the plan for you. So let me go ahead and share. All right, so let's see here. Let me go, um, so there's, there's me and there's Dr. Petak right there. So high tech treatment series number two, healing from radiation therapy. Um, Briefly, can, the Cancer Center for Healing is located in Irvine, California, really close to mountains and beaches and things like that. It's, it's a really nice area. So if you all had to come out uh, you know, and travel here, it's a pretty nice place and it's, it's very uh, conveniently located. My experience, I, I go over it every, every week, but Dr. Petak, tell them a little bit about your background. Sure. So uh, I'm a licensed naturopathic doctor in the state of California. So I did a four-year medical program at a naturopathic school called Bastyr University in San Diego. Prior to that, I studied molecular biology at Princeton University. Uh, during my fourth year in naturopathic medical school, I started shadowing here and I've been under the tutelage and, uh, of Dr. Keneally. And now, you know, I'm a colleague. I'm very blessed to be here. Uh, so I will say on that note, I'm not a radiation oncologist. My knowledge of radiation comes from medical school, clinical experience here with patients, research. So um, you'll hear me say a lot of times during this conversation that it's important that you discuss all of these types of things with your oncologist and your radiation oncologist uh, so that your whole care team is on the same page. Yeah, I agree. And, and the benefit that we have is there's what I call book, books mm -hmm. and application, right? So we get to see patients going through, uh, say chemo, for example, maybe they're doing fractionated or full chemo. And then they're also doing all these things that we talk, that we will talk about to complement that, to make sure the immune system is supported, make sure they're well hydrated, make sure, you know, all the oxygenated and alkalized and all these great things we get to see with our own two eyes, what that does for the person, mm -hmm. right? It's no different that when somebody's going through radiation, we almost get a test, your test, we get to see the subjects, right? And when they're being uh, treated simultaneously with these things, plus going through the radiation, my eyeballs tell me they do pretty well. And what patients say is my oncologist can't believe how well I'm doing. So exactly. So I guess we we get to see the eyeball test. Mm -hmm. So again, there's book the books tell you one thing, and then your eyeballs tell you maybe a little bit different. So the eyeball test for me, I, I think I've said this before. I'm 
pretty conservative with my health, meaning I do, I do a lot of natural techniques for my health. And I was one that chemo surgery, radiation, things like that, if I ever was presented, God forbid, you know, with a, a diagnosis like this, I don't fear it anymore, mm -hmm. quite frankly. And it's because of what I see every day. So I think that's important to share because sometimes you need to hear that, hey, the eyeballs, and we see hundreds and hundreds of patients a week. So it's not, we have a pretty good amount of, I would call test subjects, right? You know, not that you're test subjects, but you get what I mean. And we get to see every day, the benefits of adding some of these things with the benefits of some of these uh, more aggressive approaches. Again, gang, that's our, our first avenue of choice is certainly more natural. But if we had to do these things, that's what we're telling you that don't fear it as much because there is some good information uh, that Dr. Patak will go over, plus what our eyeballs see. Fair? Okay. Probably. Okay. All right. Let's, let's get right into it. Okay. Right? Okay, okay. Great. So what is radiation? Broadly speaking, radiation is when energy is emitted from one source and it travels and then gets absorbed by another source. And there's a whole spectrum, as you can see from this picture uh, below of different frequencies that dictate what kind of effect that radiating energy has. So the longest wavelengths of energy flowing are what our power lines can emit. That's how radio and TV and cell phones work, how microwaves heat food, uh, how ultrasound can pick up on pictures beneath the skin and deliver therapy. And then you start getting into the higher frequency, which means that there are more wavelengths per unit of time. You can see those wavelengths in the picture are getting uh, closer together, more frequent. That's when you can get the negative types of ionizing uh, radiation energy. And ionizing just means that every uh, molecule or atom has positive and negative charge. And ionization is what happens when there's so much energy in the system that those split, they become radicals and those can uh, contribute to inflammation and cause damage, yeah. sometimes in a useful way, sometimes in a not so useful way. Yeah. And, and again, it depends on what we're doing mm -hmm. simultaneously to uh, mitigate the downside. But this has to do, and we'll get to this later, but EMFs as well. There's ionizing radiation, non-ionizing radiation. Some have been proven to be more detrimental to the system than others, mm -hmm. but we'll get into that part. But yes, so ionizing would be things like x-rays and gamma rays and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. Non-ionizing radiation would be your cell phones and the towers and microwaves and computers and things like that, appliances, so forth. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Yeah, microwaves are kind of on the... On the Yeah, middle. and then I just wanted to comment the ultraviolet machine down there, that's a tanning booth, not the LED bed that we... Yeah, yeah, here yeah, fair, fair. Does everybody see that? I'll point that out right here. That's not our LED bed. Uh, this is a tanning bed, which yes. ultraviolet radiation is is uh, a form of, of radiation. Mm -hmm. Which comes from the sun. Yep. Fair. Okay. All right. Good. Yep. All right. Here we go. Okay. So how does radiation kill cancer? There's two ways. There's a direct way where the radiation comes down and it interacts with the molecules in a way that breaks the DNA essentially, and that ultimately kills a cell. And so in this example here, you can see the UV rays from the sun are interacting with the two thymines in your DNA, and those get stuck together, which completely disrupts the whole DNA sequence. So it stops it from mm -hmm. replicating, basically. Yes, yeah, so the cell can't replicate it. It passes away, and then there's no more you know, cancer there to, to grow and spread. The indirect way is when the radiation um, breaks apart water and oxygen molecules. Mm -hmm. Those are free radicals that I mentioned before that can cause inflammation. When that happens in the cancer cells, that leads to cancer cell death. So, you know, that is, that is probably more so of the action of radiation than the direct DNA damage. Gotcha. So the indirect mm -hmm. is what we see mostly with the treatments yes, that, with, that are out there yeah, with cancer with, care. With conventional radiation therapy. And the idea is that our healthy cells have a greater capacity to heal themselves quickly. They have the machinery and the tools to do that. And cancer cells, which are more focused on replicating, don't have as much self-repair mechanisms. So they're easier to damage. Yes. Fair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So the healthy cells can stay healthy because they're more, uh, well, they're stronger to do so. Mm -hmm. Fair. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's a good point. And they're adaptable. Yeah. You know, they can switch from grow and spread mode into rest and repair mode and cancer cells aren't that smart. Gotcha. Easier to kill them than it is the mm -hmm. natural or healthy cells. Mm -hmm. Fair. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. So goals of radiation, the way that it's applied in, in conventional medicine, one goal is palliative. Uh, if there is metastasis that's compromising the integrity of your bone and you know, that bone becomes unstable. It can be very painful. It can break and, and be dangerous. So sometimes metastasis are stabilized with radiation and my patients that have needed that have received it and, and do well mm -hmm. pain is eliminated. If there's a bleeding tumor, it can be stabilized that way. So mm -hmm. sometimes it's leaned on in that sense. Uh, it can also be used to prevent recurrence following a, uh, curative, treatment. For example, the common one is breast. Mm -hmm. So you have a lumpectomy or a mastectomy, you might be recommended radiation to scavenge any cells that are left over. Mm -hmm. uh, because the naked eye, mm -hmm. right? It's hard to see things with the naked eye. So I, I mean, theoretically, it makes sense that they say, hey, let's do a little bit of this radiation to make sure we just clean up everything we need to clean up. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Yes. Yeah. And so I included the study. Um, it's not the most comprehensive study out there, but I thought it highlighted the point about recurrence better. Uh, this In this study, there was 1,326 women who were 65 years or older that had hormone positive and HER2 negative uh, cancer with a... Um, all of the lumps had been equal to or less than three centimeters in their largest dimension. They had a lumpectomy with clear margins and did proceed with hormone modulating medication like tamoxifen or anastrozole. Mm -hmm. And 50% of the patients received radiation in the local area and 50% did not. And so they uh, followed the patients for 10 years and counted how many of them had a local recurrence. Mm -hmm. So those that did not receive radiation had about a 9.5% recurrence rate. And those that did have radiation only had a recurrence of 0.9%. So to your point earlier, 10%, that, roughly, roughly in mm -hmm. that 10% range. And the statistics are going to be different for cancer type, um, your age, hormone status, different kind cancer type, like I said, where it's being treated in the body. So that is not a generalizable statistic, but just meant to highlight yeah. local recurrence consideration. Mm -hmm. What was interesting in this study is that the radiation didn't affect the rate that there was distant recurrence or metastasis. Okay. So in both groups, there was a small percent of, of women that had cancer come back as a distant metastasis Gotcha. and it was equal. So, so it didn't necessarily af affect that. That's where all of the fourth pillar stuff. That's, in. that's exactly right. So, mm -hmm. so to recapture that mm -hmm. and to recap that what Dr. Pitak is saying is that yes, this, this, the, without radiation, they had a nine and a half percent reoccurrence rate without that a lower, much lower, right. Mm -hmm. Overall, almost 10%, nine and a half percent. So, uh, but it, it didn't, it didn't do anything for reoccurrence in uh, other parts of the body, mm -hmm. right. That everybody okay with that. So the point with that is that's where our process comes in and our philosophy of, well, if the cancer happened one time in the body somewhere and we didn't change the environment, right? We didn't oxygenate and alkalize and we didn't immune boost and we didn't fix the causes and remove things like infections, whether it's bacteria, viral, uh, parasitic, fungal infections like candida and mycotoxins from mold, or there's heavy metals or non-metal toxins or, or emotions. You're right. Stress, mm -hmm. hormone imbalances, all, you know, high exposure to EMFs, et cetera. If we didn't do anything with those, the reoccurrence rate is probably, you know, going to be there to, to a pretty high degree. I don't know about a high degree, but to some degree without doing any of that, right? Because you didn't change the environment. So I really wanted to make that point because that's the premise of our entire clinic. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Conventionally, remember one chapter of a 20 chapter book is chemo surgery or radiation. And it might be a great chapter for a lot of people. However, the other 19 chapters 
is the key to actually healing and lowering your risk from reoccurrence. Mm -hmm. Fair? Just how to make that point, you know, mm -hmm. that you were, you made it, but I like to reinforce that. I appreciate so. <laughs> that, yeah. Uh, and so some considerations for when radiation would be recommended or not uh, to prevent recurrence or to scavenge residual disease is age, uh, hormone status, if the lymph nodes are involved, if there are any margins from surgery that are not optimal. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, the goal is scavenge any residual cells and disease. So if you've got low margins, if there are micro mets in the lymph nodes, um, if you're of a younger age where disease is considered to be more aggressive, because when we're younger, our cells are replicating faster. So, yeah. you know, we have to be on it a little bit more. And we might have to be more um, aggressive with care. If there's any invasion into the lymphovascular system. So those are all things that show up on the pathology report that will make your oncologist more likely to recommend radiation. And so when those reports and or, uh, or that data is brought to us, we also look at those things, right? Because you're looking at us and coming here for that. Oh, what do you think about this? We get that a lot. What do you think? What do you think I should do? Well, we're kind of looking at the same information mm -hmm. and we're trying to figure out if it were me or if it were Dr. Pitak or a family member or a friend, what would we do based on our knowledge? Mm -hmm. And that's really how we treat. It's, it's looking at all that going, well, let me give you the upside, the downside. Let me give you what I know, what I see. And then it allows you to make a good informed decision. So yeah. I think that's the beauty of something like this. So. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes radiation is used with a curative intent. So for example, in some small prostate cancers, they can do local radiation and that's the treatment that you need. And then, mm -hmm. you know, that stabilizes, controls and eliminates the cancer. So yeah, it's a good mm -hmm. point because some of these cancers and uh, just bringing up prostate as an example, um, it depends on what the goal is, right? Mm -hmm. So the goal sometimes is, well, let's main, let's stabilize it and maintain and not necessarily cure. Mm -hmm. Cure might be a very aggressive uh, approach, surgery, removing it, whatever it might be. Well, there's a lot of people, uh, men that live with prostate cancer and something else causes their demise. It's not mm -hmm. the prostate cancer. So something like that could either be curative or it could be kind of palliative mm -hmm. where, where it keeps it under control. So just, again, a lot of different variables to, uh, to the decision-making process. Good? Yes. Okay. Okay, so then of course the conversation turns to what about my healthy cells? What about the collateral damage? And I wanted to emphasize that all radiation is fractionated or uh, lowered as much as possible in a way that minimizes that collateral damage. Uh, the radiation oncologist is going to consider how big the tumor is, how deep it is, um, what surrounding structures there are mm -hmm. to come up with what type of radiation you need, which I'll go a little bit into more detail about, uh, and then how big of a dose is needed and for how long. But the, and the goal is always to minimize it as much as possible. As I mentioned before, healthy cells have a better capacity to repair themselves, especially if we give them the tools that they need, proper antioxidants, nutrients, hydration, oxygenation, Which we'll alkalinity. Go yeah, mm -hmm. we'll go into that. And then it's important to consider all the technological advancements that there are, um, and they're coming out monthly. So it's always important to, um, maybe you have a preconceived notion of what radiation, what radiation entails because your mom went through it or a, a sibling, you know, 10 years ago, but it could look very different now. And so it's important to always meet with the radiation oncologist, learn what is available to you um, and learn more about the technology. So for example, uh, something that they do in radiation that has to go through the, ch the chest is consider your breathing. So um, deep inspiration breath hold is when you have to hold your breath during the radiation procedure and they'll only turn on the radiation during when you're breath. holding your breath mm -hmm. so that there's no movement of the heart into the field of the radiation beam. Uh, and then respiratory gating is when they get even more sophisticated. They have technology that can watch your breathing pattern. You don't have to control it as much, but they'll uh, actually, uh, they'll actually 
the machine will intuitively follow your breathing and know when to radiate. And then there's things like Calypso guided for prostate cancer where they implant a GPS next to the tumor. Mm -hmm. And so that when you're moving, even if you sit as still as possible, there's going to be microscopic, microscopic movement. Mm -hmm. The GPS is tracked by the machine and it'll only radiate when the tumor is in the field of the radiation beam. So there are ways to make it as specific as possible. Yeah, they're, they're again, mitigating the downside using technology for sure. So and that's not an extensive list by any means. Sure, just sure. So just the, just the examples. Mm -hmm. All right. So risk of radiation induced secondary malignancy, because that's sometimes what people mm -hmm. ask. So it's a good, a great slide. Yeah. So um, this was, this is something that I get asked a lot about, and it was interesting to research. Um, in general, I found this review paper, it was in 2018. So not, you know, from this year, but 2018, still pretty current. In 2014, according to this review paper, the risk of developing a second cancer at all, not related to treatment or anything, mm -hmm. was about 17 to 19%, which is double what it was several decades ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they said that they suggested mm -hmm. that only about 5% of those secondary malignancies were, relate, were related to radiation. Gotcha. So it's a very small perspective percentage all things considered and if you consider that the amount of secondary cancers has doubled mm -hmm. in several decades right that indicate and we're not doing twice as much radiation right. that tells me that it comes down to that pillar four yeah pillar which four which are the causes right mm -hmm. it's all those things that weren't looked at initially that then sit in the body create this inflammatory response this free radical production which damages the cells, right? So this process is oxidative stress, mm -hmm. damages the DNA and the genomes of the cell that really take the cell through apoptosis. Mm -hmm. It's cell death, it's programmed cell death. But if those have been damaged from toxins and chemicals and gosh, infections and so forth that create that inflammation in the cell, and then those cells become damaged, that's when they replicate out of control. Mm -hmm. So to, to Dr. Petak's point with this, it's not, we're not looking at it in a bubble of, okay, just radiation was done mm -hmm. and nothing else was done. That's where you're going to get some of these statistics. But if you do this, right, and I say this and over here, I mean the conventional model, and even if it's radiation, but then you do all these other things to mitigate the downside and to change your cellular environment, it's an entirely different story, mm -hmm. right? Well, and that's a really important point. And, but the, the point I wanted to drive home a little bit more was the, the conclusion of the article is that the secondary cancers are coming more from continued lifestyle right. and from a genetic susceptibility even. And, you know, that question of, is my cancer genetic gets asked a lot too. Sure. And I think, well, we know that the rate of cancers that come specifically from genes is Lower, lower, like, mm -hmm. you know, five, 6%, I think right. was the last time I, I looked yep. into it. Yep. Um, but we, what we do know is that about 10% of solid tumors do have germline mutations. So mm -hmm. mutations that can contribute to the development of cancer. It's a different way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. um, but we're thinking more and more now about, as we learn more about genetic testing, if you have someone develop a cancer that maybe they're too young to have developed according to the history of the statistic, the statistics for that cancer, it might be important to consider germline testing. So you can think about the health of your family and get more clarity on where this might have come from. So, you know, if you have breast cancer and you're younger than like 45, you'd want to consider doing it. Yeah, for sure. Um, for or sure. colon cancer less than 50. And you're, you're spe specifically speaking about genetic testing. Yeah, germline yeah. testing. Yeah, germline genetic testing, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, right? So let's, uh, and I think Dr. Pitak will agree based on the, on the research and the studies. Genetics, I, I've always been taught that the DNA is not your destiny, mm -hmm. number one. I've always been taught that genetics loads the gun but lifestyle pulls the trigger. Mm -hmm. And I think the statistics are, are on par with that. Yes. But to your point, if you're seeing things 
if you see a younger person with a certain cancer that really isn't in their age bracket, mm -hmm. then it might be warranted to do some of that type of testing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Good, good point. Okay, I think okay. that's everything. Oh, and then I would just say the considerations for increased risk of radiation induced secondary malignancy. Um, the most of the most of the statistics that we have about this come from you know, unfortunately, when kids have had had to have radiation for cancers, we see a higher rate of secondary malignancies in them if they've had radiation. So yeah. it if you're younger and you have radiation, there's more time for those multiple hits in the genome to develop, right? You know, that accumulates. And so we just have to watch and screen more closely in those populations. Yeah. And it comes down to, I think, uh, benefit versus risk. Right. So if if there's a big benefit early on and there is a risk down the line and, and how much they're using and, and what age and all those, they, it all plays a factor. But, you know, if you did your research and you had a younger, say, a younger person and they said, look, this is what it needs, then you have to figure that out now mm -hmm. and get that, you know, the kill phase, we call it, and then do as much as you can to heal the body, mm -hmm. which is part of what we're going to get to soon. Yeah. So. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Okay. I don't want to go into too much detail about this, but I just wanted to mention that there are different types of radiation and that comes down to the different types of wavelengths and frequencies that I was talking about on that first page. And then what's actually radiating gamma rays, x-rays, protons, electrons, different parts of a, an atom that gets transmitted. So, um, in general, gamma and x-rays are used for deeper tissues. They tend to spare the skin, uh, although we do see towards the end of someone's round of radiation, they might start getting the itchy red mm -hmm. um, ulcerated skin wounds. So mm -hmm. we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, but those, again, are for some of the deeper cancers. Electron-based radiation has a higher dose to the skin, so very superficial cancers, skin tumors, mastectomy scars, some lymph nodes, et cetera. Um, protons are, they use a particle accelerator to focus a beam of protons where it can go very deep into the tissue and it tends to be very specific and targeted. It's like 20 times more expensive. And that's why, you know, it's, it's not always available Use, to right. everyone. There's, there's more locations opening up in the country too, but um, there's not so many centers that sure. have the capacity to do it. Right. And when I looked at some of the maps a few few days ago, there's some on the West Coast, some some in the Midwest, and then the East Coast, but it's not available to everyone, unfortunately. So it's considered more for pediatric patients with the risk of secondary malignancy, and they're smaller, so the structures are smaller, they need more targeted beams. Um, if there's any sensitive structures like in the brain, central nervous system, in the eye. Um, and then if there's, you know, a higher risk of side effects that could impact vital function. Right. Uh, so they'll, they'll, ears, right. vocal cords, carotid arteries, yep. things like that. So yep. the head and neck. More targeted. More targeted. Yeah. There. And then, you know, hyperthermia, which is heat therapy, that is a type of radiation. Uh, so hyperthermia um, uses microwaves, radio frequencies, therapeutic ultrasound to heat the tumor cells, like kind of from an inside out. Uh, we need to get it up to about 42 degrees Celsius or 107 degrees Fahrenheit to get enough heat that it destabilizes the cancer cell and it dies, but mm -hmm. it's using heat instead of um, ionizing radiation, mm -hmm. but it is a type of radiation because it's that transfer of energy into a medium that absorbs it. Yep. Um, it's a lot more powerful when combined with, uh, ionizing radiation or chemotherapy or immunotherapy. So there might be a role, uh, of, for hyperthermia in your case, there's a, a local, you know, region that we've been sending people to, mm -hmm. to receive this mm -hmm. in a um, more powerful way. And then there's some devices that can deliver it through a patch. We have some of that Which at the clinic and, mm -hmm. and we pair it with IVs uh, a lot of times to help 
you know, support the anti-cancer effects of those therapeutic IVs. Hyperthermia, a lot of research on hyperthermia mm -hmm. and how well it works. Um, I'm a big fan, I think, of layering it. I've seen mm -hmm. when it's layered with some of these other therapies, it works really, really well. So um, that's certainly something strongly mm -hmm. that could be considered in this alternative world mm -hmm. that really has an anti-cancer um, effect. So it's good or cancer killing effect. And then I'll just comment that heat in general, because, you know, we get asked about sauna a lot and, you know, well, oh, I have a hyperthermia machine and, you know, I don't really know where those come from, but yeah. uh, there is a risk of not heating up tumors enough that might be, you know, stimulating to more blood flow and growth of, of tumors. So it's important that if hyperthermia is included, it's, you know, by a, a professional that mm -hmm. has the, the, knowledge. Um, the knowledge and the specialty to administer it correctly. Agree, agree. Mm -hmm. Okay, just in general, radiation can be administered as an external beam. So from the outside, you know, in or towards the cancer for more palliative approaches, it's generally lasting from one to four weeks. It's generally daily. Uh, if we're doing it pre or post like a surgery or chemotherapy generally lasts about three to seven weeks. And then for cure the, it's a longer treatment and that's very general, mm -hmm. but just, you have an idea of how yeah. much radiation is used. It can also be used during a procedure. So if you had a lumpectomy and they wanted to radiate the tumor bed to scavenge any margins, uh, sometimes they do it that way. That's a common way that that's used. Brachytherapy is where you actually, um, place a radioactive material inside the body and it emits the radiation over time to the local region. And then systemic is when, you know, the common type is radioactive iodine for thyroid. The iodine itself is radioactive. It gets absorbed by the thyroid and that kills the, the thyroid. Mm -hmm. All right. So lots of different yeah. options. Yeah. And then just to give you an idea. Um, mm -hmm. So if you were entertaining or you had somebody that, meet, you know, you have this information, so mm -hmm. it's all good. Okay, so some considerations for why radiation fails. Um, we have to consider the tumor size. The bigger a tumor gets, the more radiation it needs. And then the more possible damage there is to surrounding structures. So there's always a, um, an intersection. We're trying to optimize yeah. the, the effects, minimize the side effects, and sometimes size can get in the way. Um, genetic radiation resistance. So some cancers are very resistant to mm -hmm. radiation and heat, and they have ways of stabilizing themselves against ionization and, and heat. And there are tests that could help us with that? Huh? I think it has more to do with the types of cancer and statistically what we see. Um, from the research. From the research, yeah. there are some people that are testing the uh, production of heat shock proteins or lack thereof by mm -hmm. cancer cells. And mm -hmm. so that can play a role, but it comes down to how available that testing is. And um, I think it has more to do with the cancer type. And then the tumor physiology. So if you go back to what the mechanism of radiation is, some of it is direct damage to the genetic material of the cancer cells. And then the majority of it is the indirect or the creation of free radicals from water and oxygen that then cause inflammation and kill the cancer cells. So if you don't have enough oxygen in your cells, then it doesn't have the capacity to produce the free radicals from the oxygen. Mm -hmm. So low oxygen cells are very resistant to radiation. So oxygenating with hyperbaric oxygen, breathing exercises, nano bath, mm -hmm. CVAC, all the things we're going to talk about. Um, Do that, you like Ibu with that? I know I, I, want, I had that question. Well, it's different because Ibu we're actually introducing more free radical, right? It's ozone is O3 mm -hmm. and that splits off into a single oxygen and O2. So mm -hmm. that does oxygenate, but you are adding the inflammatory yeah. piece. Do that's it. a, that's a tricky one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and then also to consider that in the center of larger tumors, that can be a very hypoxic environment, very difficult to deliver, um, to deliver oxygen to the center there. Uh, so hyperbaric, I think is probably the strongest thing Good. to help okay. with that. 
And then tumor cells that are faster growing, uh, you know, we, we talked about the impaired capacity of cancer cells to repair themselves mm -hmm. relative to a healthy cell. But if the cells are growing very, very rapidly, they might kind of escape or advance faster than the radiation can, can kill them. So that's a very aggressive scenario. Um, I haven't seen that, right? you know, to be honest. So, um, and then the other three things, so things that may reduce radiation effectiveness, this is a very tricky thing to talk about. When we talk about radiation effectiveness, there is what the research says about, oh, these people took this supplement and this many had a recurrence compared to people that didn't take that supplement. That's like, you know, big population statistics. And then there's a consideration for in vitro studies, which means I have a Petri dish of cells. I'm radi I'm applying this antioxidant and I'm radiating it and seeing which ones were resistant. Right. That's very different than what happens in a person. Right. And so there are numerous studies on many different antioxidants. Some of them are in vitro. Most of them are because it's really hard to set up a double blind placebo controlled trial where half, you know, everyone's getting radiation and half of people take the supplement and right. half don't. Right. That's a very difficult, costly experiment to run. And there's millions of antioxidants. Sure. So and where's the funding going to come where's from? Where's the funding <laughs> going to come from? Um, how do you control all the other variables? Some, uh, if people are taking antioxidants during radiation and their oncologist told them not to, they're probably also doing all these other things that are like IVs, possibly, sure. you know, all the things that sure. we offer here that might make that research difficult to interpret. So all that to say, some studies are very pro-vitamin E, pro-NAC, and some are very anti I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of what all of those say in general, green tea and EGCG, the, it seems to have more of a consensus that that could, you reduce know, the reduce effectiveness. the effectiveness okay. or the, the cells in the Petri dish are, are more resistant. They don't die from the radiation that's administered during the experiment as much as, um, compared to the control. Uh, and so, you know, I don't have anything against these supplements. I think they're amazing and they're amazingly anti-cancer in general. I'm just giving you some things to things think about. Things to think about. about. And yeah. if there are other things that we know increase radiation effectiveness and th other things that do mitigate side effects that don't have negative research about them, let's focus on those during radiation and yeah. come back to the green tea afterwards. Afterwards, great. That's the kinda, vitamin E, the NACs, right? Yeah, yeah for and, sure. And the vitamin E, that one, that particular study I could have included a lot more. I don't know why I picked that one, but this one was just interesting to me. It was patients with lung cancer who took vitamin E during radiation. Some of them continued to smoke. Some of them didn't. Some right. of them took vitamin E it's and hard. some of them didn't. Right. And in general, if you continue to smoke and you have lung cancer and you're receiving radiation, vitamin E, different carotenoids, those increase your risk of it not working or it coming back. So kind of a tough one. Yeah. And they're, so basically some of these things can protect the cell, right? The healthy cell, the healthy cell, right? So mm -hmm. if we're, but if we're, if we're given radiation, the objective is to, to create free radicals, mm -hmm. right? And what they call oxidative stress in general, some of these things can protect the cell from that. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes. So that's, that's the gist of this. It's like, you know, uh, because we do hear a lot of in the conventional model, hey, when I'm giving you chemo, for example, or radiation, don't do these things, right? As a blanket mm -hmm. statement, because hypothetically or theoretically, I should say, not hypothetically, theoretically, we don't want to give an antioxidant, right? If we're trying to destroy a cell, we don't want to give something that will protect the cell. Mm -hmm. Is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. All right. So with that, that is this where some of these come in, where yes. they seem to be a little bit yeah. too protective yeah. to the cell? But I, I do think it's wrong to say, as some radiation oncologists do, that you can't do any antioxidants because right. that's not what the research shows. And that's and that's not what we see. And that's the next slide, I think. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so increasing radiation effectiveness. So let's talk for a second about hyperbaric oxygen and CVAC and some of these oxygenating therapies. So, again, the more oxygen is in the tumor cells, the more effective radiation is going to be. So if that's hyperbaric oxygen in any form you can access it the day of radiation that's great the question is do i need it before 
or after radiation. Mm -hmm. You can't do it during radiation. I'm not so picky about that. The effects of radiation persist after you're done with the actual beams, mm -hmm. like being in the office. So mm -hmm. there's an argument for it working afterwards. But yep. I mean, if you can do it daily before radiation, that's great. Uh, CVAC is the machine that we have here that's kind of the opposite of hyperbaric in the sense that hyperbaric has higher atmospheric pressure. It's, you know, coming in on you and you're breathing higher percentage of oxygen and that pushes oxygen deeper into your tissue over the course of the 60 to 90 minutes. CVAC is when you're in an airtight pod and it actually reduces the amount of atmospheric pressure on you. It's like you're going up in an airplane mm -hmm. and once you're up there, cycle right. up and down, mm -hmm. there's multiple pressure changes over the 20 minute treatment and that's encouraging gas to go in and out. So there's a more um, effective exchange. exchange of gases. It becomes more tonified. That system is more efficient. Your, your lungs have a more efficient Capacity. input output yeah mm -hmm. they call it vo2 max mm -hmm. so uh definitely can can help because mm -hmm. of that because yeah. of the exchange yeah but i i think as far as getting more oxygen deep into the tissue so that the radiation can come in and mm -hmm. you know beam it yep. hyperbaric makes a little more sense for this yeah um and so, then there's more energy for our healthy cells to repair themselves yep as from an oxygen standpoint mm -hmm. mitochondria yes. right so the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell that has more oxygen it's going to be able to um, work better and, and repair better mm -hmm. and ROS, the reactive oxygen species, yes. right? So they're, they're kind of like, uh, free radicals mm -hmm. basically. So a free radical, uh, to keep it simple, atoms that, uh, lose paired electrons and they're unstable. So the more of those unstable, um, you know, or free radicals that are there, the more damage. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want. You want that damage to those cancer cells. Yes. So, um, okay, so radiation sensitizers. So these are um, the first one, metformin, is a medication that can be used repurposed in uh, during radiation to sensitize or make the cancer cells more susceptible to the radiation. And the met the the mechanisms of that are you know pretty complex. The effect seems to be stronger in patients that have a higher hemoglobin A one C or three month average of blood sugar you know, close to or over the pre-diabetes and diabetic cutoff, the effect for radiation sensitizing is stronger in those patients. Um, but the mechanisms are still there, even in people that have more well-controlled blood sugar. So sometimes we bring all that on board. The other things, curcumin, berberine, quercetin, resveratrol, I kind of put them in order of like maybe priority from a supplement perspective in the middle of that list there. Mm -hmm. um, curcumin has more research as far as natural substances go for increasing cancer cell susceptibility to radiation. Generally, I, I haven't Googled every or PubMed sure. or Google scholar sure. every cancer type and every, sure. you know, whether just or not, generally, but just generally, some generalizations. Um, that's why when you meet with a doctor here, you yeah. can get more specificity, yeah. but these are kind of general generalities. And then the quercetin, resveratrol, sulforaphanes, those had more of that Petri dish in vitro research. Okay. Harder to generalize to the general the population, to what happens in the body, but, um, you know, interesting results there. And then, as I mentioned before, on the hyperthermia slide, radiation has some synergistic effects with heat, mm -hmm. with chem different chemotherapies, um, with different immunotherapies and checkpoint inhibitors. So sometimes it's uh, kind of a one plus one equals three situation with various conventional treatments even mm -hmm. too. Yeah, mm -hmm. them, trying to put them all together synergistically to get the best effect. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So we so talked, hyperbaric. yeah, we talked about the hyperbaric already. Let's see if there's anything else. Yeah. <sighs> Pressure, mm -hmm. uh, pure oxygen. So that the pressure basically allows for the oxygen to get deeper penetration into the tissues, mm -hmm. right? To keep it simple. Yeah. And then the boosting the white blood cells bullet point is interesting to consider too. If we have damage to cancer cells, there's going to be a lot of debris that needs to be cleaned up. Mm -hmm. White blood cells are responsible for coming in, breaking that down, engulfing it, cleaning it up. So there's that effect as well. Mm -hmm. What's sign that's significant, mm -hmm. you know? Okay. CVAC I touched on already. Here's the space pod. 
um, mm-hmm. that kind of goes up in elevation. Yep. It's a 20 minute treatment. Um, it's a pretty new technology. Mm-hmm. There aren't that many of them. Um, but so the, the research on it isn't as robust yet, mm-hmm. but the effects that we're seeing are pretty significant. Sub- yeah, pretty substantial. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this slide, preventing and managing side effects related to radiation. Whenever I'm counseling someone, you know, who's about to go through radiation or who is going through it, it's what kind of radiation are you getting it? How and where is it being applied? Mm -hmm. Side effects are going to happen directly or they may happen directly at the site of where the radiation is being directed Mm -hmm. uh, and then in surrounding structures. So it's kind of this is organized. I got this idea from my professor in med school, but organized by different systems. So these are just general researched considerations for where radiation is being applied and some possibly helpful interventions. Um, In general, superoxide dismutase or SOD uh, is a product that scavenges free radicals, uh, superoxide specifically. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that one you can take cleaning up, mm -hmm, cleaning up. Um, a side effect of radiation in the head region is swelling in the brain. A lot of research on Boswellia or frankincense. Uh, as also in that location, we can have some brain fog, cognitive impairment that uh, we want to mitigate. So melatonin, carnitine, and then more anecdotally, things like fish oil, ginkgo, bacopa. That's a, an herb that interacts with the central nervous system very well. I'm being, I didn't include anything like dosages or amount or timing because it's really important that you work with a practitioner yeah, and all these things there might sure. be other reasons why you can't take these supplements i'm not trying to withhold the information but no ginkgo for example is blood thinning if mm-hmm. you're on a high dose of blood thinners for some other reason it's not appropriate for you to take very much of that so yeah just be with a practitioner that can guide you through this process for sure. These are, again, just some generalities that can help, Mm -hmm. but you certainly, and I think most people would, if they're going through radiation or chemo or something like that, typically they'll have a, uh, should be at a clinic like this, right. Uh, Mm -hmm. To be able to uh, offset the downside plus clean up everything else that we talk about. Mm -hmm. Or uh, again, plan is for me, the plan is the key. If you're doing the four pillar approach in the plan and you're getting the right labs and oxygenating and alkalizing and you're immune boosting and you have a star phase and a kill phase and you're handling the causes, you're doing a pretty good job wherever that might be. But make sure it's under the guise of a, of a healthcare practitioner for sure. Okay. And then if we're in the head and neck region, or even if we're in the breast kind of armpit chest region, we can affect the esophagus and the breathing, the airways. So for inflammation or mucositis of the mucosa or the esophagus, back of the mouth, all the way down to the stomach, uh, glutamine is an amino acid that help that the cells in our digestive tract uses their main fuel source. So that helps them regenerate. Um, it comes as a powder, so you can actually like mix it with honey, turmeric powder and kind of gargle it and swallow it, uh, DGL or an extract of licorice that doesn't have blood pressure modifying uh, potential is very uh, demulcent and soothing to the mucosa. Mm -hmm. So those are helpful dermatitis or skin reactions. There's um, aloe has some kind of mixed results. Most people feel better when they use it, just put it directly on Calendula is an herb that is very repairing to the skin and anti-inflammatory that comes in different creams and antioxidant creams. There can be inflammation in the lungs or kind of like a scarring effect. So anti-inflammatories and enzymes Mm -hmm. like the Nutrazyme and Mm -hmm. Wovenzyme, those things can help break that down. Cardiovascular system loves coenzyme Q10. Hawthorne is a cardiovascular herb. It's very uh, tonifying and supportive. Now, you know, as we move into more of the abdomen around the prostate, colorectal region, we can get diarrhea. So glutamine comes around again. High dose probiotics have good research. Berberine's in there and that has the radiation sensitizing effect as well. 
um, in the pelvis or gynecological malignancies or prostate. We're thinking about inflammation in the bladder. Some of that damage and inflammation can make us susceptible to secondary infection too. So cranberry and demanos, which are antimicrobial or they prevent the adherence of microbes in the, in the uh, bladder and urethra from, you know, so that the microbes can't crawl basically in those areas. Um, slippery elm bark is very demulcent. You can mix it with cool water and it creates a mucilage that's very soothing. Kind of like what happens if you make overnight oats and the oats get that like slippery oh, yep. texture. So you can drink that. Overall fatigue is, there's a lot of research on this. The more moderate exercise you can do throughout the course of radiation, the better the fatigue gets, which is hard when you're tired, yeah, right? but that is very effective. And then anemias, if any of the bone marrow, which is what produces our red and white blood cells is indirectly hit uh, or intentionally hit, we can get low blood counts in the months following radiation or during it. So uh, ashwagandha, astragalus, eleutherococcus, those are all herbs that are tonifying and stimulating in a good way to the bone marrow. Yeah, good list. Good list. And that's good. You oops, you broke it down like you did. Mm -hmm. So that's good. Okay. And hydrogen water. water. Okay. So this is a fun one. Um, as you can see on the right, there is a picture of a hydroxyl radical, which is when the essentially hydroxyl plus hydrogen equals water or water. When you add radiation breaks into the hydroxyl and hydrogen. And those hydroxyl radicals are what are causing the inflammation. If that is persisting longer than is needed during radiation or it's persisting in our healthy tissue, we're causing more inflammation and it can be quenched with hydrogen. Uh, and you can get water that's infused with more hydrogen than regular water. So you're replenishing what's been stolen or damaged by the radiation. So. I did find a study, it's very small, only 49 people. They had uh, liver tumors and they were receiving radiation. And for six weeks, they drank the hydrogen water and the control group drank regular water and there was improved quality of life and improved radiation tolerance and reduced blood markers of inflammation in those who were drinking the hydrogen water. Very small study, but it's emphasizing you know, the potential mechanism there. And importantly, there was no negative effect on the efficacy of the radiation uh, in that study. And I don't remember how long they followed them for. So yeah, but I mean, at up. least it's something that's fairly easy to do. Mm -hmm. So it can't hurt, right? So it's things like that, when you read that, it's like, okay, I, I'll do it can't hurt. So drinking the radiation wa uh, water, excuse me, drinking the hydration <laughs> water, hydrogen water during the radiation really helps. And then you can actually apply the hydrogen water to local areas. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's good. yeah. Do we have a specific slide on that? Mm, no. I don't think so. Okay. So, so, uh, Yukari here does these amazing hydrogen washes where she'll soak red and flamed ulcerated tissue in hydrogen over the course of her treatment and mix it with some acupuncture and I've been astounded by some of yeah. the before and afters and Definitely what the patients helps. have told me. If you're getting to that end point of radiation and things are just starting to get really irritated, mm -hmm. it can be really powerful. And hydrogen water is not, it can be found, it's available. Yeah, for sure. So, for sure. Okay. So, general takeaways um, generally, people tolerate radiation better than they expect. Mm -hmm. It's this big, scary, demonized word. And but if we need it, we need it. Mm -hmm. And people are generally surprised. Yeah. Yeah. True. I mean, the head and neck and throat area can definitely be uh, very irritating, but there's a, there's a means to an end and a necessity. But from what I've seen, a lot of the rest of the, the areas of the rest of the body, people tolerate it pretty well. And again, they're not just doing the radiation either. We see it where they're doing all these um, or, or many of these different you know, procedures or therapies that you've recommended, or even the supplements to mitigate the downside. So I think we have the luxury of seeing it 
not just radiation, mm -hmm. but radiation with all these great things. That's why even personally, I don't really fear a lot of this anymore when I did before, just because I know how to mitigate the downside now, mm -hmm. right? So, and get the benefit out of it if, if needed. So anyway, go ahead. Well, as far as your um, skin goes and, you know, how you should prepare, the radiation oncologist will give you a list of do's and don'ts and what soaps are okay. In general, you don't want anything that's going to have a strong fragrance to it or leave a thick residue or oily residue. Um, you can use a light moisturizer. Um, there are some antioxidant calendula creams that are available to help prevent some of that skin irritation. Those are generally safe and okay. Um, I didn't know fully how to wrap up the conversation about antioxidants. I think that's good though. Yeah. Generally safe. Generally safe. A lot of them improve radiation sensitivity or um, meaning the cancer cell is more susceptible to the radiation. Don't seem to affect in the population studies radiation effectiveness. But I would say that each person with the help of their healthcare professional should look up what kind of cancer, what's the supplement, and what are the, what are the what does the research say about it? And if there are things that we know improve radiation effectiveness and minimize the side effects, let's focus on those and everything else can kind of wait. And that's generally what I say about IV vitamin C as well. You do. Okay. Mm -hmm. So even though it has that hydrogen peroxide effect potentially in the cancer mm -hmm. cell, um, mm -hmm. that combined with the radiation, could it be I think I mean, as, I think I mean more as a blanket statement. Yeah. So some of the research I was seeing about IV vitamin C was getting more specifically into dosing. Gotcha. So like Since, under, yeah, under yeah. 25 grams is very restorative and antioxidant right. 30 to 50 is gray area 50 plus is pretty generalizably pro-oxidant pro which is damaging to the cancer cell by the way mm -hmm. which so is radiation so it can have a uh, mm -hmm. twofold benefit potentially and this is where you have to run it by your healthcare provider is it could be immune boosting but it could also be pro-oxidative mm -hmm. to the cell so it could have a benefit but again you got you have to you have to kind of work through all this with a provider and if you're already undergoing a tremendously anti-cancer therapy, do you need the high-dose right. vitamin C twice a week during that? Right. Probably not. Right. Um, maybe once every two weeks is enough. And I think I did see a study that suggested that was fine. Okay. Okay. Post-radiation care. We talked about the superoxide dismutase, <clears throat> talked about the hyperbaric oxygen, hydrogen, orally, and as washes as needed, gargle it, enema with it nebulize it mm -hmm. a lot of options there um and then oral and iv antioxidants afterwards are totally fair game mm -hmm. a lot of iv formulations for scavenging free radicals have like the alpha lipoic acids the b vitamins lots of minerals are needed to repair damaged tissue and rebuild some of the damaged infrastructure so yep. we need to really emphasize the nutrition protein intake we need more protein during and following radiation. Yep. Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, along these lines, I don't know why this popped in my head, but if I had, if I had gotten several concussions and I did nothing, then my chances of those concussions turning into some form of inflammatory brain degenerative process is pretty high. But if I did a lot of these things for my brain as well, the chances of that turning into something damaging is a lot less, especially the sooner you can do it following. Yes. So, so I don't know why that popped into my head, but it's very similar. It's a good parallel. Mm -hmm. It's, I could do nothing and have probably a high potential for some damage, or I could do a lot of things like this and have very little damage, but still get the benefit out of it. Mm -hmm. The fair. So that's, that's the whole, that's the whole, uh, I guess, concept of this, of the lecture right there in a, in a nutshell, mm -hmm. the fair. Yeah. And I did want to comment on grounding yeah. and voltage work too. So um, that's something that we're doing a deeper dive here as a clinic mm -hmm. into right now. And in general, we don't think of ourselves like this, but we're very electric beings. Our every cell is polarized, every cell and, charged. Is polarized and charged. A synapse firing is an electric transmission. Mm -hmm. And when we undergo surgery, stress, radiation, and there's free radicals formed, that voltage and the polarization of our cells is impacted. Yeah. And so 
I didn't look up a study on grounding, but grounding can restore voltage. Um, our cell sonic mm -hmm. restores voltage, PEMF machines, anything we can do to charge us back up following is going to make our cells communicate better, synapses fire better. Mm -hmm. Charge is what gives proteins and enzymes their shape. Everything, all of the functions of our body depend on our charge. Yeah. And the mitochondria mm -hmm. too. So yeah, we have the biocharger now, um, the mead mm -hmm. um, uh, and the biomodulator. Right. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a lot of different things that from the research, and this is what Keneally is really good at is keeping our eye on the research and what, what we're, they're finding and then trying to bring it to the clinic. So there's another piece of the puzzle that we're correcting and the chart, the charge and the voltage of the cell, there's just so much research coming out to that. So mm -hmm. good point. Um, okay. So some of the products just to kind of review. So for hydrogenation, the active H2, if you're in the clinic, you'll see this a lot of times in your orders because this increases hydrogen. And uh, again, from a standpoint of, uh, you know, the radiation and, and offsetting that, I mean, obviously hydrogen is really good, but it's, it's good for a, a lot of other things too. So very, very good. Um, so the curcumin, uh, Dr. Petak mentioned that several times, that's there. So, uh, you know, you have a good, Good picture there. The resveratrol. I think curcumin and resveratrol is in my repertoire every day, uh, just because of the it, it decreases some of these inflammatory proteins in the body. So I like to take those personally, but to offset the or to increase the efficacy of the radiation. Berberine, great for a million different things, but that's on your list as well. Mm -hmm. Very good for blood sugar uh, regulation as well. And digestive health. And digestive health, very good. Um, so this, this machine is the one that we have at the center. Um, this is, uh, basically it's for, uh, hydrogenating the water and alkalizing the water. So I put that in there in case anybody, Hey, how do I get maybe hydrogenated water? Well, this is a good product to use. It's what we use at the clinic. Uh, so just wanted to give you that you have a, a phone number there, uh, just in case. Okay. All right. So, uh, let me, let me wrap it up. Uh, just by saying, uh, number one, the, the plan, right? We talked about the plan, the four pillar approach. So these pillars, we want to get individualized lab testing for sure, because we want to make sure we're less cookie cutter, mm -hmm. create a more individualized, comprehensive approach. We want to get an idea of your circulating tumor cells or the stem cells. These are the cells that cleave off the original tumor could be circulating around the blood that increase the chance of reoccurrence. Right. We want to get um, testing on your metabolic function. We want to get into that cellular, you know, the cellular dynamic, if you will, to see how your cells are functioning. And then if you're low on certain vitamins, nutrients, minerals, things like that. And those are just two examples. There's a long list of those as well. But labs help us create a more individualized approach as opposed to the cookie cutter concept which individualized medicine, I think you would agree, that's the future of healthcare. Mm -hmm. Second, we want to make sure in our four pillar approach, we are starving the cancer cells potentially. Those are the repurposed drugs that Dr. Pitak uh, referenced. And then we want to figure out what the kill phase looks like. So the kill phase could be all this natural treatment that we talk about, or if it's more aggressive, it could be fractionated chemo, which we provide here at the clinic. It could be chemo, regular chemo, surgery, radiation, uh, et cetera, right? So some, what I tell patients is probably the most important thing that we need to figure out, at least immediately, is the kill phase. We need to figure out, do we need atomic bomb or do we need more of a, a bullet or a cannonball, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then we then need to figure out Pillar, pillar three, which is, are, or are your immune boosting, right? Whether that's the supplements, your vitamin C IVs, your mistletoes, your artisanates, things like that. CVAC, hyperbaric. CVAC, hyperbaric. Mm -hmm. And that falls into, we also need to alkalize and oxygenate the body. So we need to change that environment that cancer cells love, and they love low oxygen, high acidity. So we want to alkalize and oxygenate. And that's a standard for really everybody. It's kind of our part of our plan, right? It does get more individualized as more data comes back, but that's a general rule of thumb. Al uh, alkalize, oxygenate, and immune boost. And of course, pillar four uh, are your causes. And we've mentioned that several times. So if we're 
trying to peel back the layers of the onion as to why your body is, is no longer able to identify and kill off a bad cell. There's reasons for that. And typically the immune system and inflammation and things like that are involved. And they're caused by what I call fuels to the fire. Too much gasoline creating this inflammatory fire that's creating damage. So that's where we get into really uncovering um, what, what could have happened in the body that's creating this. And a lot of these things, ladies and gentlemen, are missing from that conventional model. It's not a bad thing, right? Because this, this one chapter can be very, very helpful. But um, these other 19 chapters of the 20 chapter book, I think are the plan that everybody should be following. Unfortunately, not everybody knows about these things. And that's why we in part do this cancer conversation. So we can teach for this movement of making sure that we're maximizing people's health and function um, while going through a chronic disease like this. So, um, so that's, that's your four pillar approach too. So let's see, um, let me just try to pull up. If we can't get to a lot of questions because of time gang, like we always do, we'll make sure we get the questions. Uh, Shep who, who uh, controls a lot of the uh, IT for this, will make sure that we get those questions answered and back at you. So um, let's start with uh, with the top uh, five cyber knife treatments on tumor and spine and one lymph node. Want to know when to start detox after this treatment? Thanks. I think in general, uh, once the radiation is over after a day or two, you can certainly start IV supplements, etc. It's just during it when the radiation is being administered that you want to uh, be mindful of what you're using and taking in. Yep. Okay, so Ms. Barber, thank you for these wonderful presentations. Here's my question. Since radiation therapy is not shown to clear cancer stem cells, and if your oncologist is pushing you to have it, what can you tell your oncologist to let them know that you do not want to have radiation and there's no evidence of disease, cancer has been removed, and the radiation is recommended as preventative? So this is where we, yeah, this is where we get into some of the details of the pathology and, you know, what what is a radiation oncologist or oncologist using to say you would benefit from radiation? If yeah. it's a blanket statement of, oh, your this cancer type always gets radiation. If it's truly something that's not congruent with you and your beliefs and what you want, then I think there's a conversation there and you just have to, you know, stand up for yeah, it. Right. Um, but there could be something on the pathology or yeah. maybe you're a younger person or, all these other things, small margins, right? micromets to the lymph node. There's no big, obvious, visible on imaging mm -hmm. residual disease, but there might be evidence of small micro spread locally. Right. Um, it's true radiation doesn't impact circulating tumor cells. And that's right. where, you know, we have a big emphasis. Yep. So yep. Um, there might be... I would say, let's take a close look at your pathology, go over it again with your oncologist. Mm -hmm. okay, we'll give her two cents and, mm -hmm. I, and I'll give you a, a quick example as far as breast, breast is concerned. There's uh, a score of that KI-67 score. Mm -hmm. That's the proliferation rate of the cells. Well, if that's really high, but they feel like they've gotten everything, and I'm just using it as an example where they, there's clear margins, but if there's still some things left over, and they proliferate pretty aggressively, maybe that's a consideration. Mm -hmm. Is that is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. So so it, it's not there's no blanket statement with it. It's kind of like looking at all of the path report, looking at all the variables, and then making maybe having that informed decision to make mm -hmm. based on it. Or recently I had a woman who's over 65. She had a biopsy proven breast malignancy. We weren't sure about the extent of it yet. We did, you know, decide together that she should proceed with the recommended surgery. She had it removed and there was zero lymph nodes. She had really good margins. Mm -hmm. uh, so even though for her cancer type, radiation would be recommended, right. she also has a history of um, myelodysplastic syndrome mm -hmm. or a, mm -hmm. an anemia, a chronic right. anemia that can progress to a lymphoma or leukemia. So she was already having a hard time producing red and white blood cells, radiation would make that worse. So in her case, everyone agreed that radiation would not be a good idea. Sure. Yeah. Right. And there's va those variables. So every patient has variables that 
and and we we just provide data and help, but we're not going to tell you one way or the other what to do. But we will point out some of those variables, you know. And uh, again, informed decisions. So radiation exposure protection for follow up scans and X rays. I think we went over those. Yeah, I They're generally all like the SOD and the hydrogen and. Yep. 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 Uh, let's see. So. So coming to the clinic for testing uh, for cancer and then if money is an issue, can the treatments be done a little at a time and some things a person and by perform from home? Well, yeah, and it, and it really depends on, I tell everybody this, depending on what's presented, we'll let you know what we feel should be done and the aggressiveness thereof. Mm -hmm. Some people have to come here and stay here for quite a while because of what they're presenting and they choose us because they want to do say fractionated chemo and they want to do, you know, all the modalities to help offset um, the downside of chemo and get their body strong and healthy during the process. Right. So that's a, that's somebody that we would recommend fully. You'd have to be here and kind of go all in, but then there's other patients that are coming here. They've had surgery, they've had uh, potentially radiation and they're, they're kind of NED, which is no evidence of disease as an example, and they want to come here for all the other pillars. They want to come here for the oxygenation, alkalization, immune boosting, and to fix their causes. That could be somebody that's here for a while, little while, then go home, and then we can work from afar. They come back here and there, right? So there, there are different variables that, that dictate that process, Barbara. So I, I hope that helped a little. Um, radiation uh, for airplanes, cell phones damaging too. Yeah, good. This is the EMF, you know, question, right? So ionizing radiation is proven in the research to be damaging to the DNA. The non-ionizing radiation, I personally believe the amount that we get now, I think that's the problem because there's a lot of quote unquote research that says non-ionizing radiation, which is, you know, airplanes, cell phones, computers, you know, appliances, et cetera. There's evidence that show it's not, but I, I personally believe it's the inundation of these non-ionizing radiations that are a problem. That's my personal opinion. Yeah, it's cumulative. If you cumulative. if Great you point. do an airplane ride around the whole world, that's like a PET scan kind mm -hmm. of thing. Right. So yeah, there's there's an amount of radiation there. It can add up. Um, so it's something that we have to be mindful of. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and we can protect ourselves too. So when we fly, we can do certain things. We could put our cell phones in the cases. We'll get into that in an EMF, the electromagnetic field discussion for sure. But yes. Um, do you rec uh, recommend something like certain supplement, uh, sub supplements. probably supplements like vitamin E for someone to help get it dental x-rays. So great. That, so some of these questions were asked earlier in the mm -hmm. session and they're probably answered based on your, so we'll let that one go. Uh, if the studies show, uh, uh, Chip, you keep moving it on me while I'm trying to read it. If the study shows it doesn't extend your life as indicated on your slide, why would one receive it? That comes back. I think the research is certainly there for a local recurrence. So that I, I think a lot of people would agree on. It'll prevent local recurrence. If you have features of your case with a higher chance of local recurrence, that's what it's treating. Right. It's not, and if local recurrence then leads to it progressing to metastasis, that's what ends. Right. That could end your life. Yeah. Right. Right. So. Right. Right. Fair. Yeah. No, oh, makes sense. So, how can radiate? Oh, wait. Can a non-cancer person come in the health side and get evox, ebu, without having to get a full workup done? Non-cancer. Sure. Mm -hmm. It's uh, you go on the wellness side, which is the number. 949-867-6419. Miles will set you up. You can, I mean, they'll definitely take a history just like any doctor would. They'll go through a consultative process and then they'll dictate, okay, you need this or you need that based on what they're finding. Or if you just want to do wellness strategies, they can apply that uh, or recommend that as well. So yeah, very easy. How can radiation, uh, let's see, how can radiation be made more effective for pancreatic cancer for these cells that have stromas around them? Good question. I don't know that yeah, answer. Yeah, I'm a little less familiar with that specific consideration. Um, if that decreases the penetration of the radiation into the pancreatic cells, um, I think 
there could be an argument made for things like cell sonic and mm -hmm. enzymes to break down. Yeah, that, we but... would probably have to get either Keneally, maybe even Devlin to, to look at that one and, and maybe answer that. Mm -hmm. I'm honestly, I, I don't know, to be brutally honest. Um, what do you think of radiation to decrease pain of met metastasized cancers? Mm -hmm. I think it, I've seen it be helpful mm -hmm. at times. Yeah, me too. So I think that could be uh, something. And again, if you mitigate the downside, but some of these strategies, I think that will be helpful. Um, let's see, Loma Linda, California has pro time beam treatment, one of the first locations. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. Thanks yeah. for sharing. That's awesome. Uh, what everyday radiation should we try to avoid? And what do you suggest we do proactively when we can avoid some of this exposure? Yeah, I think that's the EMF discussion, to be honest mm -hmm. with you, we're going to do Marley a full you know, a full uh, uh, conversation on electromagnetic fields, what they are, how to protect yourself. So I'll, I'll defer that for that time and, and we'll figure out when that we would do that. Do we offer radiation? Good point. We do not. Um, and is offered to children. So we don't do radiation here. If we feel somebody needs it, we have affiliated uh, uh, practices and practitioners that we uh, refer to. So EGCG, I'll let you handle that one. That's an extract from green tea. It's mm -hmm. a powerful antioxidant, even more so than vitamin C in some cases. So mm -hmm. PMF does increase irradiation effectiveness, right? Mm -hmm. That's there. Sublingual uh, calendula also help with skin issues. That's interesting. I haven't, mm -mm. I don't think I've been, I've thought about that before, but the idea is you want the constituents from the calendula herb to get to the site of inflammation. So if it had to go all the way down through your digestive tract into your blood, into the skin, it might not help. Not sure. Um, that's probably going to target the digestive tract better. I'd say topical is better for skin. Yeah. Oh, so Gwen asked, what do you recommend for cervical and bladder cancer? I went through two months of radiation only therapy. I'm now having hyperbaric 2.5 atmospheric pressure. How can I protect my ears during a hyperbaric? That's a hard one. Um, what else can I do for cervical and bladder cancer? I mean, the, the endo laser is, can be fantastic, right? Yeah. So real quick about the ears. I mean, with all those pressure changes, the middle of your ear is has an opening that goes to the back of your throat. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if that's open, you're not going to have ear challenges. It's when people have a lot of congestion mm -hmm. that the ear pain can happen and you can even get a ruptured tympanic eardrum. membrane, yeah. rup ruptured eardrum. Yep. So sometimes you can take like decongestion mm -hmm. over the counter, decongest Just gotta decongestion, make sure, like, you pull down yeah, pop the ears and, ro and rotate the jaw <laughs> because that will open up that uh, that uh -huh. canal that doc's talking about. Uh -huh. Oh, uh, we'll take a couple more gang. Uh, what about ozone IVs? So that's something we've kind of mentioned before. Um, it does have the oxygen, but it also has the radicals. So it might, depending on the dose. Yeah. Add to right. the effectiveness, right. Maybe cause a little bit more inflammation. Mm-hmm. Um, so how many parts per million of hydrogen water can we drink daily? I don't have the answer to that. No, me either. I don't know. But I think it's generally safe and tolerated. Yeah. I haven't had anyone have any side effects. No, and I drink it all. So my, this here is a, I fill this, I don't know how many times a day with hydrogen water. So, um, I, I'll be the experiment. I think it's pretty good. So I'm not sure about that. But we can always find out. All right. Last one. What clean, pure vitamin C absorbic acid can you recommend? That's not necessarily corn derived. We have our camu camu mm -hmm. here. Yeah. Camu, I think that's probably, mm -hmm. that's the one I think would probably mm -hmm. be best. Um, all right. So let's see one more. Cause uh, I got, I have 35 doses of radiation. Now I have fatigue and I'm a bit anemic. Any thoughts? Yeah. Honestly, a lot of the things that you've learned on tonight's, uh, cancer conversation, Eric, I think you, you're, you're going to need now, uh, you know, we got to figure out the anemia, but you're going to need the IVs and you're going to need the some exercise. of the supplements and you're going to need, you're going to need to really heal now from the radiation. So at the end of the day, you're fatigued because your mitochondria that produces energy is now affected to some degree. Plus if you're anemic, your iron levels that bind oxygen are low. So you're not going to have the oxygenation to the tissues, which affect the mitochondria that produces energy. Now there's a lot more going on to that, but yeah, it's now a matter of what you learned in the conversation tonight. Mm -hmm. That's where you want to start. 
What you got? Okay, actually, one more I want to do. Yeah. Can your clinic help me decide if I should wait on radiation or if I should proceed? And that brings up a good question about when is radiation appropriate? Yeah. If it's following a surgery, for example, they generally need it to be done within like six months. Yeah. I know that's the case with cryotherapy. So there is a bit of a timeline that's important to consider for radiation if it's used as a neoadjuvant or adjuvant pre or post. Mm -hmm. But meeting with one of the doctors Mm -hmm. and helping them walk you through that for for sure. Um, I I do want to answer this one, uh, finances, right? Uh Because how does one pay for all this? Well, here's here's, uh, my, my opinion. Okay, so you have the conventional model and we understand the insurance participation there. And we also understand that you're only going to get so much from that model. Now, that's what that's the reality. These uh, a lot of the modalities that we talk about, they're not covered by insurance. So they're out of pocket. Not I always say not our fault. Right. The system is antiquated. So what they provide coverage for is what they have in their standard of care, but that's not going to get you well. And I think that's well proven, right? Uh, Even what we talk about the four pillars. My opinion, I tell everybody, if finances are a problem, I wouldn't hesitate for a second to do GoFundMes or fundraise. This is my personal opinion, by the way. It it might not be the clinics, but it's my personal opinion. I would do whatever it takes because of what I see in the clinic every day, watch with my own eyes as to how well it works for people. I would try to do whatever I could to make it work. And if I had to fundraise or I had to come up with some, you know, some strategies outside of the box strategies, I personally would do it. That's my, that's my opinion, just because I think that's what's going to help you the most without question. But I understand it's hard to pull water from a rock too. Yeah. And if, you know, I think that's what one of the beauties of the four pillar approaches is it helps us organize your plan so that even if we can only do a little bit in each category, all the categories are covered and, you know, the big fancy machines might make things go faster, but I've seen even removing like negative things from your life be as powerful as adding in something that's really fancy. And no question. And that's where part of my role in the clinic is to help the patient prioritize their care. The orders may look this big, right? And the doctor's like Dr. Petak, her job is to weed through all the data and go, okay, I think you need these things. And that list could be pretty long based on what's presented. Then when I get the pa- with, with the patient a day or two later, we can have a conversation on, well, what does your time, energy, money look like? What is your commitment to this? How much can you commit as far as time, energy, or money? And then I can do exactly what Dr. Petak said, is I can help prioritize the process. And that's one of the roles in the clinic. I get to talk to you more with more time that the doctors are just trying to create a plan to heal you, right? So again, that's that's what we do. We have people in the clinic. That's why we're a team, Mm -hmm. exactly right. So, okay, everybody, I know we went a lot longer than we said we would. I think the information was was very relevant. I think Dr. Petak did a phenomenal job as always, she's very well studied and researched, which I know you that came across and she is, she's very thorough. And uh, we appreciate that doc. And I appreciate you, you know, uh, hanging out with us tonight. Yeah, so, happy to be here. yeah. So, so uh, we'll get the rest of the questions answered and get them back to you all. Uh, if you need anything, don't hesitate to, to reach out the new patients for the, for, if you have active cancer, 949-867-6374, or want to work on prevention, that's the number. And then the uh, new patients uh, for the wellness side are going to be the 949-867-6419 number. And then the perfectly healthy store where if you needed supplements or wanted anything, that's the number there. And the websites are, are there as well. So again, anything you need, just reach out. We'll help you in any way we can. But we always wish you the best and um, much love to you all. We'll see you in a couple of weeks, everybody. Bye, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye.